Hi, this week's review is on one of Friendly Arm's maker boards called the Nano PC T3. Stay tuned for a rundown of its strengths and weaknesses. Hey Dad, have you seen this great Nano PC? Why are you pointing up to the ceiling? No, it's a Nano PC, on my finger. Really? Yeah, I'll boot it up for you. See? No. Oh, it's, it's running the battery again. Um, hold on, let me just get my power backs. Well, that's handy. The T3 is a third release of the Nano PC from Friendly Arm. Friendly Arm has been around for a while, but they're only just starting to churn out SPCs in an attempt to hit the maker market, uh, people wanting some more PCs and basically anything else in between. The Nano PC has a bit of an identity crisis, however. Let's open it up and see why. The package was delivered in less than a week from China to Australia, which is impressive as it usually takes a whole lot longer. The package was, well, interesting. Not sure what the purpose of the anti-static bag on the outside of the box was for. The Nano PC comes in three flavours, each one having similar connection options, but the difference being the MCU used. The T1 runs a quad-core Cortex-A9 and 400MHz. The T2 runs a quad-core Cortex-A9 with dynamic frequency up to 1.4GHz, and the T3 running an 8-core Cortex-A53 up to 1.4GHz. Everything was very well packaged with no doubt about protecting the components. I ordered three different boards from Friendly Arm. The Nano Pi 2, the Nano Pi M3, a 3D printed case for the Nano Pi 2, and also another one for the Nano Pi M3. And lastly, the Nano PC T3. For this review, we're just looking at the Nano PC T3, which arrived in a proper non 3D case. So what does the Nano PC T3 give us? Starting from the top right, working clockwise. A DVB camera connector, SD card slot, which according to the Friendly Arm documentation is on the bottom, an RTC battery header, two USB 2.0 header pins, micro USB, boot select button, more on what that does later, one gigabit ethernet, two USB 2.0, MIPI CSI, reset power and LED headers, HDMI, MIPI DSI, headphone jack, DC power jack, power switch, which physically removes power to the board, microphone, UART for console, LVDS header, three LEDs, two of which are programmable, Wi-Fi BLE antenna socket, soft power button, RGB LCD header, and a GPIO which is not the same as a Raspberry Pi header. Just a word of warning, do not attempt to plug in any GPIO hat, as you will with 100% confidence do a lot of damage. And lastly we have the Samsung S5P6818 Octa-Core Cortex-A53 under the heatsink, 1 gigabit RAM, and 8GB eMMC. This is probably the first disappointing thing about the board. Only 1GB RAM to play with is not a lot of RAM, especially when you have 8 cores. The usual ratio is at least 1GB per core for it to be worthwhile. But still, this is being targeted as a maker board, I think. Not sure about that actually. So the board comes in a see-through plastic case, but as you'll see there's a few hiccups to it. The front of it gives you easy access to all the ports, which is okay, but when we come to one of the sides we find that there's no holes for the camera header, no holes to allow the USB headers to come out, and no way to be able to press the boot select button. This side at least has a hole for GPIO cables to pass out, but someone made a mistake on the positioning of the hole. This side isn't any better, with no access to the power switch and LVDS header, but they have bothered to put in a hole for the reset button at least. So really the only thing for it is to take the cover off. It comes off fairly easily, but it would have been nice to have some extra holes to avoid having to do that. So all we need to do now is connect up HDMI, keyboard and mouse, and I also chucked in an SD card for testing, Ethernet, and finally power. Switch it on and the green LED will indicate it has started to boot. I had to use my TV again for this board because I don't have a full HD monitor and if you have an LVDS to HDMI adapter plug it won't be able to take advantage of the EDID from your monitor. For Linux the resolution is fixed at 720p and requires modification of the kernel to change that. The Nano PC T3 comes preloaded with Android 5. It's a stock Android 5 OS and nothing special about it. You've seen it all before. So on to some basic testing. Yes, YouTube worked with that issue from the browser and from the YouTube app. It was fine really. Next on to some testing with 3D Mark. Now because we only have the Mali 400 MP GPU, we're frankly going to see some fairly predictable results, but it seemed to be a lot smoother than the Pine64. It came up with an overall score of 2365, 
which was to be expected. The Antutu test was smooth in a jerky, I haven't really spent much money on this sort of way, and spat out a result which was down the bottom of a long list. GFX bench was surprisingly smooth through all the tests until we came to the T-Rex benchmark, which once again showed just how much money I had actually spent on it. So what test results did we end up with? Something equal to a Samsung Galaxy Tab 2, or a Samsung Galaxy Tab 4, and slightly slower than a Google Nexus 10, and about on par with an Odroid X2, but failing dismally compared to an Odroid XU3, however, beating the pants off the Pine 64. Now before I get onto the Linux testing, I thought I'd point out some of the support that you'd expect from Friendly Arm. From the Friendly Arm's website, we have the forums and wiki sections as the main resource for support. But for some odd reason, we also have a FriendlyArm.net website with a very old products page, minimal documentation on old products, and another forum with almost zero replies on every post. Strange. But wait, they have a third website with some very old news download page and the forum link pointing back to the friendlyarm.net website. It really is all very confusing. I'd like to make a suggestion to Friendly Arm. You really need to sort out your websites. Get rid of the redundant websites or have them just point straight back to your master website. Remove all the old information. Make sure it's up to date and consistent. Otherwise it makes it really hard for people to find the information and puts them off your product a lot. Remember the initial experience is what counts for customers. So armed with three websites worth of conflicting information, I really wanted to find out what the Linux side had to offer since I'm a maker. There's two ways of booting the Nano PC T3 either directly from eMMC, or if you hold the boot select button while you power up the board, you can boot off the SD card, which is found on the bootum of the board. The green LED will flash to indicate it has loaded the kernel and started to boot, and you'll see the usual boot process of Debian Linux, and arrive 25 seconds later to a desktop. Not bad. There are two onboard LEDs that are available for you to control. Yeah, that works okay. I moved on to the 30 pin GPIO and wired up a tricolor LED to three GPIO pins. Figuring out which GPI pin corresponds to what in Linux is tricky, but check out my website for more info. A simple shell script does the trick, and yep, it all works as expected. Next I wired up my Max 7219 matrix controller to check out the SPI bus. And yes, that all works okay as well. So now onto some Linux performance testing. I downloaded the Pharonix test suite and ran a battery of tests over a couple of days. And the results were interesting. For example, the floating point operations were about the same for the upboard and the Jetson TK1, twice as fast as the Pi 3, and leaving the poor old Pi 0 in the dust. High-end testing such as flak encoding saw it matching the Odroid C1, which seemed a little odd that it didn't match the upboard. I saw the same thing for the MP3 encoding and also the FFmpeg video encoding. Skymark saw it on par with the Pi 3, and RAM speed saw it matching the upward closely, but with some variance due to the differences between ARM and x86 architectures. So what do all these performance tests really mean? For the average maker, everything works as advertised. Well, I only tested the GPIO pins, and I haven't really tested out the LCD and MIPI interfaces yet. The non-Raspberry Pi GPIO header is a bad design decision and as a major drawback for those wanting to use a Pi hat. The inbuilt Mali GPU makes it a poor choice for high-end video. It places it in the same performance point as similar price boards such as the Raspberry Pi. The lack of memory makes it really unsuitable as a desktop. Just forget it. However, you have eight cores to work with and combined with the floating point speed increase over the Pi 3, this board really is more suited as a compute engine. If you want to run floating point intensive calculations with CPU space to spare for real-time tasks, then this might be the board for you. Why not run five of them in a compute cluster? Good for speeding up builds. So what rating would I give this board? I'd give it a 4.0 out of 5. Non-standard Pi headers, casing issues, and very conflicting support information on their websites really lets it down. There are actually several more things I'd like to test on this board, but I ran out of time for this video. If you want me to add anything else to the list, then comment below and I'll add it to the video. Thanks for watching this review on the Nano PC T3. The next review will be on the chip. It's actually been screaming out to me for months and it's been sitting on my desk. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and you can support me by subscribing. You can also follow and subscribe to me on all the other social platforms. So, see you next week.